This is quite a big video today. We are going to go through the concept of binding energy, binding energy per nucleon, and how that connects into nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. The specification references I've given at the start of the video, so let's get right in. We know that some isotopes of elements are unstable because they have extra neutrons in their nuclei, and that they're called radioisotopes. We covered that in a previous video. But the question is, why do these extra neutrons make the nuclei unstable? And then what happens to these unstable nuclei? We know that they decay, naturally, and that they lose some of their energy by ejecting particles or energy. And we're focusing on particles in particular here. But why does this ejection of particles increase their stability? To answer these questions, we need to understand what happens when a nucleus is formed and how it stays together despite the fact that the positive charges inside are repelling each other. Let's take an example of the helium-4 nucleus, something that we know is ejected quite often from the nuclei of an unstable atom. As we know, the helium-4 nucleus contains two protons and two neutrons, so let's start looking at the masses of each of these particles. Now, before we get into those masses, you need to understand something about this here, this little u. This U stands for the atomic mass unit, and sometimes you see it written as AMU. And this is given in the data book for you, so you don't need to remember this number. 1U is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Once you do a lot of nuclear calculations, you get used to just remembering that, but you don't have to. As I said, it's in the data book. Now, the mass of a proton is 1.0073U, and the mass of a neutron, 1.0087U. And when you do the multiplication, you multiply that number by what 1u is equal to. These are the values that you get up here. So we know the mass of an individual proton, and we know the mass of an individual neutron. Before we go on to use that in the helium nucleus, there's only one more calculation that I think it's very useful to do. And that is the conversion of u's to mega electron volts. You'll have met mega electron volts or electron volts before in the quantum physics section in year 12. You also use it in the particles section. But let's just find out how many mega electron volts 1u is. So we know that 1u is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So the first thing we have to do is turn that into energy. And we use Einstein's very famous equation to do that. So we put 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 in there, multiplied by the speed of light squared which is 9 times 10 to the 16. And what you get is 9.34 times 10 to the 8 electron volts. And of course, that is 934 mega electron volts. Now, as we go through this video, it will become much clearer why it is very useful to remember this. It is not given to you in the data books, book that 1U is 934 mega electron volts. And you will also see this quoted as different numbers elsewhere. It depends on the number of significant figures that you use for the value of u. And so you see it given as slight different numbers, but for Edexcel purposes, because this is the value of u that they give us in our data book, this is what that translates to in mega electron volts, so that is the number that you should remember. And you'll see why later. Back to our helium nucleus, we have the masses of each proton and each neutron that is inside the helium nucleus. If we add up those masses, Obviously, the helium nucleus has two protons and two neutrons. And so you're adding two times protons plus two times neutrons, giving you a mass, total mass of the particles, of that much. And this, of course, should be the mass of the helium nucleus, because it's made up of two protons and two neutrons. However, in fact, the mass of our helium nucleus is this much, 6.645 times 10 to the minus 27. Now let's go back and look at what it should be. 6.696 times 10 to the 27. So we've got some missing mass. And that missing mass, not very much, but it is there. And that's 5.1 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. And this is what is known as the mass deficit. You sometimes see this written as mass defect. Same thing, the mass deficit the missing mass. This mass has been turned into energy.
and this is the energy that is holding the nucleus together. How much energy? Once again, we can use Einstein's equation. There's our missing mass at delta m. We just multiply that by the speed of light squared, and we end up with 4.59 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. Or if you want to put it in mega electron volts, you simply divide that 4.59 by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to turn it into electron volts, or by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13, because of course there's a factor of 6 there, to turn it into mega electron volts. This concept of binding energy is best explained by looking at how easy it would be to split the helium nucleus apart again. So essentially, these four particles are now stuck together because they have lost some of their mass. And that mass has been turned into energy when the particle was formed, when the nucleus was formed. And if we think of this mass difference as a difference in energy, then we have this 28.68 mega electron volts less energy in the nucleus than the four particles had. It means that if you want to split apart the nucleus, you would have to add this energy in. And this is what is called the binding energy of a nucleus. It is the energy that binds the nucleus together. You can do this for any nucleus. The total mass of the individual particles is always greater than the mass of the nucleus. And the bigger the nucleus, the greater the energy difference, because each added nucleon gives up a little bit of mass. So it doesn't matter which nucleus you use, if you add up the number of protons multiplied by the proton mass, add up the number of neutrons and do the same, you will find that the mass of the individual particles is always going to be greater than the mass of the nucleus itself. Test it out and see. This is not the full story, however. While it is true to say that each nucleon gives up a little bit of mass towards the binding energy, neutrons, because of their greater overall mass, will give up relatively less than protons do. This means that adding extra neutrons contributes relatively less to the increase in binding energy. And this is where these neutron-rich, larger isotopes come in. Although, as the nucleus gets bigger, the binding energy does get bigger, it is now shared out amongst lots and lots of neutrons, and therefore you're getting less relative mass being given up. Because of this, a more useful concept to consider is the binding energy per nucleon, which we write as B over A. This is the total binding energy found by finding the mass deficit and turning that into energy, either in mega electron volts or joules, and then dividing it by the number of nucleons in a particular isotope. And the easiest way to think about this is that it is the average energy needed to break off just one nucleon from the nucleus. So every time you wanted to remove a nucleon, you would have to add in this amount of energy. And of course, to take all the nucleons out, you'd have to add up, add in, this amount of energy times the number of nucleons. So it all adds up to the binding energy in the end. What this does is it allows us to see the relative stability of each of our nuclei. Because if you have to put in a lot of energy per nucleon, it means that the nucleus is very stable. But the less energy you have to put in per nucleon, it means it's easier to break off a nucleon, and therefore your nucleus is less stable. In other words, nuclei with greater binding energy per nucleon are more tightly bound together. So harder to break apart. You'd have to put in more energy because you'd have to give that binding energy per nucleon back in order to do so. This is a classic graph and one that appears on a lot of exam questions. It shows how the binding energy per nucleon varies with nucleon numbers. So you can see we started hydrogen down here and our last isotope is uranium-238, shown on this graph. Elements with a high binding energy per nucleon, so up here, these are the ones that are very difficult to break up. They are very stable. 
And as you can see, iron-56 up here is the most stable nucleus and therefore has the highest binding energy per nucleon of any element. Some notable features of this graph. Nuclei with the very high mass numbers over on the right-hand side here, caused by lots of neutrons, these can be made to break apart into smaller nuclei with a release of energy because the binding energy per nucleon will increase when they do. The nucleus becomes more stable. The difference in binding energy per nucleon is released as energy. And we can calculate how much energy is released by going, okay, let's find the difference in binding energy per nucleon of, let's say, uranium-235. When it fissions into its daughters, multiplied by the number of nucleons, the 235. So we're finding out how much energy is released per nucleon times the number of nucleons. That'll give us the total amount of energy is, that is released. On the other side of the graph, we can see that if you can get the light nuclei to join together, then the total binding energy per nucleon increases, as well as the binding energy in general. Because the relatively large increase in binding energy compensates for the greater number of nucleons. And this is true up to the peak of iron-56. So summarizing this graph, the higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the nucleus. Very large nuclei can become more stable by moving up this curve towards the peak. And in order to do that, they have to increase their binding energy per nucleon. Very small nuclei can also increase the stability by moving up towards the peak. And they do that by increasing their binding energy. And because they have so few nucleons, their binding energy per nucleon increases as well. As you can see, moving from the right up towards the peak, fission is the reaction that causes a release in energy in that direction, and fusion is the reaction that causes a release of energy from left to right up to the peak. We'll come back to fission and fusion in a moment, but in the meantime, let's just have a quick look at some of typical binding energies. You don't need to remember these. This would always be given to you, or get, you'd be given some means to calculate it. But deuterium, helium, lithium, you can see that as the nuclei get larger, the binding energy increases because we have more nu nucleons. If we look at the binding energy per nucleon, we can see there's our peak of iron-56 at 8.79 mega electron volts. That means you'd have to put that much in for every nuclei if you wanted to break up the iron nucleus. Contrast that with uranium-235 or 237. It's still quite high, but less than these smaller isotopes, which means that if you move that way, you are producing more stable nuclei that are harder to break up. And of course, the fusion direction goes up towards iron-56. So let's talk for a moment about fission. So nuclei that have a high nucleon number, that is, they are usually rich in neutrons. They have a relatively low binding energy per nucleon because they have so many neutrons. And so they're relatively easy to break apart. All it takes is the addition of just one more neutron. And that's what we're seeing here. We've got this neutron comes in. The uranium-235 has gained a neutron and turns into 236. And in doing that, becomes even more unstable. And it breaks into barium-144. This is one possibility. And krypton-89 with the release of three neutrons. Now, this is something that we learned at GCSE. So we should be familiar with the idea of nuclear fission. But how does this result in a release in energy? This is the big question. Well, let's have a look at the binding energy. Now, there's a lot of numbers I realize on here and a lot of calculations, but we'll work through a couple of them and you'll see. So uranium-235 has got 92 protons. So we multiply 92 by the number of U per proton, and it has 143 neutrons. So again, we're finding out how many U's in the total number of neutrons. And so this is our mass of nucleons, the mass of the particles themselves. 
This number here is the actual mass of a uranium-235 nucleus. And so you can see, again, that they're different. You have lost some energy, and we've lost 1.9178 U. That's our missing mass, or mass deficit. And we can very quickly convert that into mega electron volts using our 934 per U conversion. And you can see the benefit here. That is the equivalent of 1791-ish mega electron volts. So that's the uranium-235. Let's look at the binding energy of our two products. So barium-144, 56 protons, 88 neutrons, same process. That's the mass of the individual nucleons. And here is the mass of the actual barium nucleus. And again, you see you've got a mass deficit, of course, because that's what happens when you form a nucleus. 1.27945U. And again, we can just very simply convert that into mega electron volts using our conversion factor. And again, for the third time, krypton, protons, neutrons, mass of the individual particles. There's the mass of the nucleus. And here's our mass deficit. And that's its equivalence in energy. Okay, so far it's not really telling us very much. We can clearly see that uranium-235 has a higher binding energy than either of the other two. So this is the reason why binding energy isn't really a very clear concept to see what happens. You really need to go to the binding energy per nucleon. So let's do that. So here are where the binding energies for each of our radioisotopes. And if you divide that by the number of nucleons in each, down here, you get your binding energy per nucleon. And this is where the key is. You can see that both of the products have a higher binding energy per nucleon than the uranium-235 did. And this means that energy has been released. The average binding energy per nucleon of the fragments is just the average between those two numbers, and that gives you 8.4745. And if you compare that with the binding energy per nucleon of the uranium, you can see that the average binding energy of the fragments is that many mega electron volts greater than the binding energy of uranium-235. And if we want to find out how much energy is released, then we simply take that difference, our 0.8545, like we said before, the difference in binding energy per nucleon, multiplied by the number of nucleons, which in this case was 235, because that was our original nucleus, and we see it's about 200 mega electron volts. The about is there because we're using the average. The average energy available from a single chemical reaction, like the combustion of coal, is about 20 electron volts. So you can see that a single fission event releases about 1 times 10 to the 7 times more energy than combustion. If you want an exact number of the amount of energy released, you can total up the mass of the reactants, that is the uranium-235 nucleus plus a neutron, and compare it Compare that to the mass of the products, or barium-144, or krypton-89, or three neutrons, and then convert any missing mass into energy. And you'll figure out exactly how much, but it is around 200 mega electron volts. Okay, so let's talk about fusion. If two nuclei with smaller masses join together, you also get an increase in the binding energy per nucleon, the left-hand side of that graph. So these reactions also release energy. This, of course, is the process by which stars emit energy, and there are many scientists all over the world right now working on trying to produce energy through fusion on Earth. And it is worth researching some of the most hopeful versions of that. I'll see if I can find some links, and I will put them in the description box for you. The fusion process inside our Sun, or any star, involves a series of steps that converts four hydrogen nuclei one, two, three, four, into one final helium nucleus. And this is, of course, called the proton-proton cycle. You need to know the mechanism by which this occurs. And so it's worth our time just having a quick look through it. You can see from this that six hydrogens in total go into the reaction. But the reaction also produces two hydrogens at the end with the helium nucleus, so our overall consumption is 
4. Each pair of hydrogens in this cycle goes on to produce a deuterium nucleus like this, which is heavy hydrogen, hydrogen that is one proton and one neutron. Each of these deuteriums now fuse with an additional hydrogen to produce a light helium nucleus. So this is a helium nucleus with two protons and only one neutron. And then these two light helium nuclei fuse together to produce our regular helium and our two extra hydrogens. There are gamma rays and neutrinos released as this occurs, but this is the mechanism for fusion. So our overall reaction then is, four hydrogens go in, in total. Those four hydrogens yield one helium nucleus overall, plus two positrons, plus two electron neutrinos, plus two gamma rays. So that is our total reaction. The two positrons annihilate with two electrons from the surrounding plasma in the star, forming four more gamma ray photons. So our end result is helium, our electron neutrinos, and gamma ray photons. The neutrinos stream from the sun constantly, and the gamma ray photons gradually make their way out of the core of the sun to escape as visible photons. Edexcel are also pretty hot on you knowing the conditions that are required for fusion to occur. And there are a couple of possibilities that it, they allow for you to say, the most important being high temperature. And we'll talk about what we mean by high in a moment. Generally, it's also high density. We need a high density because we need to have lots of particles in the same place in order for the chances of collisions between those particles and therefore fusion to occur. And usually, they'll also accept high pressure. But of course, generally, high temperature goes with high pressure. So the temperature and density of the hydrogen atoms and the gas cloud itself needs to rise to extremely high values. This is because our two positively charged protons, four in all, but in order to, to form the heavy hydrogen, we need those two protons to fuse. Those will repel each other that, with a force that increases as they get closer, as we'll have learned in our study of Coulomb's law. And the temperature and density required in order for fusion to occur are in the order of 10 to the 7 Kelvin for temperature and 105 kilograms per meter cubed for density. Let's focus on temperature for a moment. If we want fusion of two hydrogen nuclei to occur, they have to approach within a certain distance of each other. Now, as they approach, their kinetic energy gets converted into electrical potential energy. And we know that the formula for kinetic energy of a gas particle, half mc squared is equal to 3 over 2 kT from thermodynamics. And we also know that electrical potential energy is given by kq squared over r. So our q squared here is the charge on one hydrogen nucleus, and that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So we're going to square that. And of course, k is equal to 1 over 4 pi eo. And there's our r. Now, R, of course, here is going to be the minimum separation, and that's roughly the size of the nucleus, and so we allow that to be 10 to the minus 15 meters. And if we do this calculation, we will find that we get a temperature required in order to have enough kinetic energy to get within this radius. The temperature required is about 10 to the 10 Kelvin. This is an overestimate, however, because fusion can occur if the nuclei approach to distances greater than 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's because of a process called quantum tunneling. This is not something you need to know at A-level, and of course we're focusing here on what you need to know, but it's worth again having a little research to find out what this quantum tunneling is. And this is what puts 10 to the 7 Kelvin as the benchmark temperature at which fusion occurs. And our sun's core is at 1.5 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin.
Let's look at the amount of energy that is given out by a fusion reaction. And to do that, we go back to our binding energies. So the binding energy of hydrogen is obviously zero because it's a single proton. But once you put a proton and a neutron together, then you start to get binding energy. So there's our proton and our neutron. That's the mass of the individual nucleons. And there's the mass of the deuterium nucleus. And we are missing not very much, but 2.7753 mega electron volts equivalent of mass. We also know that those deuteriums fuse with another hydrogen to form light helium. This is the calculation for light helium. Same calculation again, you're finding the mass of the nucleons and comparing it to the mass of the actual nucleus itself. And again, we've got a mass deficit and therefore a, an energy, a binding energy being produced. Let's compare that to our first binding energy and we can see that our binding energy is going up every time we do this reaction, as we would expect it to do because we've got more nucleons. If we look at the binding energy of helium-4, there's our mass of nucleons, there's our mass of helium-4, and that is our mass deficit equivalent to our binding energy. And of course, that gives us 29.4 mega electron volts of binding energy. We should see that throughout this process, the binding energy per nucleon increases. So let's see if we do. I will do these calculations and speed them up. You can pause it at any point and have a look. So I'm just going to take the binding energy for each one and divide it by the number of nucleons in each nucleus and see what happens to our binding energy per nucleon. clearly showing us that as these fusion reactions happen, our binding energy per nucleon goes up and therefore energy is released.